Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I was glad when they said unto me, let's. Let's go to the house of the Lord. I, I've heard that many times. I see so many familiar faces. I mean, smiling faces. Uh, people I've talked with, met with, connected with. Got Beethoven over here on the keys. Let's go. Um, and give honor to your pastor, the ministry team here. You guys have a... A good thing going. You have a good thing going here, and I, uh, I honor and I, re- I respect that greatly. My wife wished she could be here today, but she is. She's actually ministering right now herself. Well, she's actually getting ready to, yeah, landing gears down. She's almost done right now, and uh, we're kicking off here. If you've not mess- met Cammy yet. You, you're missing out on life, y'all. That's my wife, by the way, uh, for those that don't know. She will, she'll be here tonight, and you'll see our, our kids and the rest of our family, and we are, we're excited to be, to be with you. I, uh, I, was once working, I was working with a guy. I know we've been standing for a little bit. In a second, I'm going to have you guys sit down. I'll do the rest of the standing for you, I promise. Um, if, and again, if you, if you have something in your body, matter of fact, go ahead and sit down. Go, go, go ahead, go ahead and rest, rest those. You might need your energy here. But I remember uh, I was actually working down in, in Florida at the time, and I, uh, long story, I was taking a guy, he, had, he had, uh, was heavy, heavy into uh, cocaine and a bunch of stuff like that, and I was, I was working with him. I was like, man. Time flies, like 2003, so I was like, I don't know, like 20 years old, I was 22 years old, something like that. And um, I remember he'd been, he'd been in a house for a while, and he'd trying to recover, trying to kick it, right, trying to break it, and um, hadn't been able to go to any type of church, and he finally got, got released, and I picked him up, and I was, I was driving, him, driving him back uh, over to the church where we were at, where we were meeting. And I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard people say, I was glad when they said unto me, let, let us go to the house of the Lord. I've heard, heard it most of my life. But I'll never forget that we were, we were pulling up into the, into, into the, up to the church. And I hear him, he says, he, he, he looks over and he says, I was glad when they said to me, and tears, I mean, tears are pouring down. This is a big dude, right? Tears are pouring down his face. We hadn't even gotten to the church yet. Tears rolling down his face. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because when, you, when you're away from something for a while, if you've never had ribs, well, you don't know what you're missing in life. But when you've had those ribs that hit the spot, when you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, when you've felt community, you've come together in a place like this where you can worship, sing, worship freely, and, and you go without for a while, and then you get a chance to get back into it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let's, one, one more time, I know it's Pentecostal aerobics, but if, but if we could stand up just one more time and, and stretch a hand towards heaven, I believe God's going to impart some things here today, but beforehand, I wonder if we could just lift our hands towards heaven and just bless the Lord for a moment. I wonder if from the deepest part of your heart, deepest part of your mind, You can fill this house with gratitude that the King of kings and the Lord of lords would would, would invite us into his presence and would meet us here. Jesus, we worship you, God. We, We glorify your name. We give you all praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor, Lord. We're so thankful, Jesus. 
We're so thankful, God. You didn't have to save us, God. You didn't have to find us in billions in this, in this planet, God. You didn't have to see us, but we're grateful today, Jesus. We say thank you, Lord. We give you praise and we give you glory and we give you honor. Why don't you clap your hands unto God with, with a little backbone today. Put a little, put a little grease into it, as they used to say. Jesus, we worship you. You're worthy of our praise, God. Hallelujah. I, I want to I talk with you from one topic. It's praying from purpose. There's a bunch of caveats I could have put on there, worshiping for purpose, all kinds of stuff, but for today. And I, I want to read this, this piece of scripture before we, before we move forward here. And it says this, James 4, 2 through 3 says this, you have not because you ask not. But watch this. You ask and don't receive because you ask amiss. You have not because you ask not. Well, well that's not it. <laughs> Even if you're asking and you ask amiss, there's no difference. I want you to catch that. There's no difference from asking amiss and asking not at all. Both equal. Anything times zero equals? Because see, and you, and you may be seated. There is, there's transformational power simply by asking the right questions. Okay, here we go. I'm going to hydrate, and then it's... One thing I, I, I try to, I often, I often speak when I was preparing for today, and I was in prayer. If you ask a bad question, you get a bad answer. <laughs> you, now, I, I don't know, some, some, some of you knows this. Um, but my mother, she's from deep south Alabama, deep, deep south Alabama. And uh, I won't go, go too, too back into history on you, but a quick history lesson. In the days of slavery, a lot of times, and my grandmother, and, and they, they actually had to go out and pick, uh, pick cotton. That's a whole story for a different, different, different time. But, but they used to go to these hills, Right? Because they didn't have food, they'd be starving. And they found that there were certain kind of dirts that they could eat and at least feel, feel filled. Now, it wrecks havoc on your body, but they would eat it because it's better than going hungry. Ish. A big ish, right? Well, my mom was at this uh, corporate banquet. See, um, lot of, long story short, she ended up becoming a chemist. And she's at this corporate banquet, and they said, bring something... <laughs> Bring something ethnic from your family, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring something that, 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 that shows the, just about, about, about your roots. So my mom, from deep south, uh, went to college, came get up there. She, she decides, I know what I'm going to bring. I'm going to bring dirt. <laughs> now, these, these dirt things, and I've, I've seen them. Anybody ever seen those, 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 those um, like dark chocolate balls that have the powdered sugar? On? They look exactly like that. I mean, exactly like that, right? And, and while she's there, a gentleman comes up, and he, <laughs> her supervisor comes up. He's, he's tasting all the stuff, and he comes up, and there's a, they, they say, take, get bite-sized pieces. Like, perfect. And he comes up, he comes up, and he, he grabs one, and he says, Here's the question. What's this? She says, dirt. He laughs. And he pops the thing into his mouth. She said, he starts gagging. He goes, he's spitting it out. He's trying to be dignified in his suit. He's spitting out there. He's spitting it out. He's like, this is dirt. And she's like, 
Yeah, that's what I said. It's, it's dirt. See, he asked a bad question. See, what he should have asked is, what is this made out of? Right? Because here's the deal. When you ask the wrong question, you can very easily be misled. When you ask the incorrect question, now, guys, we, we work with marriages a lot, and, and a big thing we always talk to people, like, you ask the wrong question about your marriage, why can't we ever communicate? Well, your brain's going to answer that. Well, this person does this, this person does that. You tracking with me? In life, why am I never enough? Well, okay, Here, here's, here's, here's something you did in your past. Here's something that's wrong with you. Here's why you're, are you tracking with me? When you ask the wrong question, you get an answer. Okay. But when we pray, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask am- amiss. Jesus, watch this. Why don't you care? Well, it must be because of this. Well, it must be. God! Why won't my family ever turn back to you? Well, here's reasons. Here's reasons. Here's reasons. Now, if I fall down these stairs, man, these are some steep stairs, and I like to move. I wish I was spiritually enough to say I'll never slip and fall down these stairs. That's not the case, okay? I'll just get back up, and I'll stretch it out, and we'll keep on going. Watch it. You ask the wrong question, you get a bad answer. But what happens is instead of asking God questions like, why am I not enough, to how did God make me enough? What if we switched our questions from how could God love me to why does God love me? Now, these are, these are simple, small words, but they change everything. When you kneel down to pray or you come to worship, and in the part, a part of your heart is saying, God, how in the world did you make me worthy of this? What do you think happens inside of your heart? What do you think happens inside of your mind? What do you think happens inside of your father? When you come to him and say, God... See, many times, our God relationships are constrained by insecurities. They're constrained by fears of failure. They're constrained by all these. Did I break something or is that something else? Am I, are we good? Okay, we're good. They, they give me the thumbs up up here. All right, all right. I appreciate you, Brother Tim. Let's go. They're constrained by all these these ideas and thoughts, these insecurities. But if you can start shifting, I'm about to talk to you about how. First and foremost, what we are thinking about ourselves and God, what we have labeled ourselves to be, what we think that we can arise to or where we think we can sink to. When we shift these ideas and start asking God from the deepest part of our hearts, God, who am I? What am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do? One of the, uh, it, always, it always jumps at me. Everybody knows the story of the lost sheep in Scripture. If not, the shepherds with the 99. One of the sheep get up and it runs off. One of the sheep leaves. Right? It, 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 it disappears. Watch this. Jesus, in this example, he leaves the 99, awesome. He goes to find this one lost sheep. But watch what he does. He doesn't just find this sheep because by this time it's dehydrated, it's thirsty, it's beaten down, it's broken. It doesn't know the way back home. Are you tracking with me? Anybody ever felt that in life? You don't know how to get. You want to live for God. You want to go to the next level with Jesus. You want to connect with him deeper, but you don't know how to get there. But watch what he does. He doesn't just come and say, hey, you're lost. Get back home. That's not how your father operates. He, the Bible says he picks up that lamb, puts it on his shoulders. The only thing the lamb needs to do in this space 
is to say, I don't know why you left me for 99. I, I can't figure out the ups and downs. Sometimes I don't know my left from right. I don't know how to make it. I don't know how to get it right. I don't do it right. I, I know I come sometimes and I look like I'm okay, but many times I'm not okay. And I don't know how to, how to, how to get back to normal. But understand your heavenly father didn't just come to save you. He didn't just come to say, hey, do this, 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 and that, and, and live this, 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 this way. That's not what he did. Your heavenly father came to save you, but then to pick you up, to set you on his shoulders shoulders and bring you to where you need to go. But it's important not to resist what God is trying to do in your heart, do in your mind. Are you with me? It's important to be able to say, Jesus, take me, because when we get this right, we can start moving to the next point. The next point is understanding the power of your prayer. Because nobody... Nobody likes to do the same thing over and 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 some of you getting mad at me right now and over and over and over again and nothing changed. They've done studies on this. People would rather have their salaries cut than do a job that means nothing. To do a job that just, they're, they're not accomplishing anything. They're not, they're not doing anything. Matter of fact, what you find is when people get into this space in the corporate world, watch this, listen to this, listen to this. They become disengaged. They become burnt out. They become stressed out at home. Track with me here, track with me. They start doing just the minimum to get by. How many prayer lives, how many prayer lives are sitting in buried graves? This is what the enemy tries to do. Because we tried, we tried, we tried, we tried again, and nothing seemed like it was working. I'm praying and it feels like it's bouncing off the ceiling and slamming back into the ground. I'm crying out to God. Can I talk to you for a little? I want to help somebody. I'm, I'm, I'm reaching and I'm praying. And next thing I know, I start getting burnt out. Next thing I know, I start withdrawing from some things. Next thing I know, I just want to get here in time. I can just come and sit. If I can... If I can just do the minimum to make heaven, and the enemy is like, thank God, thank God. Because understand what he understands. In the book of Amos, I want to read this, I want to read this, I want to read this, this verse to you. To understand why God wants our prayer so bad. And I made it up those stairs, so let's go. <laughs> In Amos 3, 7 says this, surely the Lord... Watch this. Does nothing, slow down here, because this, this, this messed with me. And if, it wasn't in, if it wasn't in King James, right? <laughs> Surely the Lord God will do nothing. Watch this. Man, I don't, I don't want to jump too much into it. A clearer, a clearer um, pull from this, from this verse here says this, does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Nazi Germany, they, uh, Nazi Germany, Hitler, he, he's sitting around this table and he has all of his generals, and he's arguing with them. He's, he's fighting. You can imagine probably the, the smell of stale c- cigar smoke. They're, they're around this table, and they're arguing back and forth. They're yelling at each other. Uh, World, War, World War II is going, and Hitler is saying, no, we're going to invade Russia. We are taking Russia. They're saying, we, there's no need to take Russia. We can, we can secure Europe, and, and no one can do anything. He's like, we're attacking Russia. And finally, they decide to attack Russia. And they roll their panzer divisions. They roll their, 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 their armies into Russia to attack. And while they're going across, many, many emperors have died right in this space called Russia because it's so big. 
and winter sets in. I know there's some other stuff that happens, Stalin graph. Winter sets in. And when winter sets in, they began to freeze and slow down. Their machines start breaking. They're, and the, the strength, the two strengths of the Nazis was their speed. They invented the Blitzkrieg, which Hitler learned in the, in the, in the trenches of World War I. Uh, they invented the Blitzkrieg. They'd go through so fast and go so quickly that the enemy couldn't, couldn't get, their, get in their feet. Strength number one. Strength number two was their equipment. They had, they had advanced equipment. Get this, guys. When the enemy, when they lost their advantage, they were utterly demolished in Russia. Dem- it was the, we sometimes think D-Day was the turning point of the war. It was not. It was this die-out in Russia that dictated the, the fall of the Nazi because they lost their tactical advantage. Hear me, saint of God. Hear me, apostolic. Your tactical advantage is not the best programs. It's not the, it's not the best sound, media. It's not the best lights. It's not the, that is not your tactical de- advantage. Your tactical advantage is this thing called prayer. Your tactical advantage is what God says. He says, I don't do, and look through history. God doesn't part the sea until Moses moves. God, God, doesn't, God doesn't, doesn't start a nation until Abraham says yes. All through scripture you'll find every single time. Could God have said Goliath dropped down? Right. He doesn't. He waits till a man. God always accomplishes his purpose through union with mankind. And that union is released and activated by prayer. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's your prayer. It's when you lift up your voice and you speak and you begin to proclaim and you begin, this is what moves mountains. This is what breaks chains. This is what, this is what brings us into victory. It's your tactical advantage. This is why the enemy tries so hard. Not to just get you to stop praying, but first to get you to start praying amiss. Because if you pray amiss long enough, you'll self-select out of the battle. In the meantime, God has bundles of blessings, bundles of giftings, bundles of deliverance, bundles of the things, the very things you're after. But we have not because we ask not. If you don't ask, oh, here we go. You bind the hands of God. All through scripture, watch it. God, God's getting ready to destroy the entire world. What does he do first? Hey, Noah. I want to shake someone's prayer. We will not change this world through political agendas. We will not change this world by powerful preaching. We will. The way that this world will be changed is when we bring heaven into earth. And the only formula we've been given to bring heaven into earth as Jesus looks at his 12 and says when you pray our father which art in heaven your kingdom come it comes from prayer it's in your prayer apostolic it's in your prayer lose anything don't lose your prayer don't lose your prayer Musicians can start coming. We're going to put the landing gear down. What the enemy tries to do so, so effectively is he tries to shift our purpose 
or move us away from our purpose. And if you've missed everything, out, everything else, tune in for this part. I'm even going to clean off the head, right? What the enemy tries to get us to do is to get us to start praying from our pain. Okay. He tries to get us consumed with our pain. So when we're going to pray... Our first question is, what am I feeling? Bad question. How are you going to make a way? How long? The enemy tries to get us to shift from praying from our purpose, and every person in this place has a purpose. Your purpose isn't my purpose. My purpose isn't your purpose. Every prayer, you have a different purpose. But the enemy tries to get us to stop praying from the position of our purpose to start praying from the position of our pain. Because he understands. If he can get us chasing pain and not our purpose, our prayers They're not your kingdom come. Your will be done. They shift to my kingdom come. My will be done. And and your heavenly father, he's seen the beginning and the ending. And he's like, no, no, no. Every man thinks he knows, but the end it's death. He, your heavenly father, I know you got, you got ideas how your kingdom should look, see, feel. But I'm looking and I see how that ends for you. And so he's trying to get us. I can't step in that space and just answer those prayers. Because if I answer those prayers, it's akin to me letting my two-year-old go run across the street back and forth. Because she wants to have a good time. I can't say yes to that. Romans 12, 6 to 8. Because we got to find our purpose. But I don't know my purpose. Thank God. Good question. I don't know. I don't, uh, what's my purpose? Yes. Now you're, you're starting to shift. From pain to kingdom-mindedness. Watch this. Romans 12, 68 says this. Having gifts that differ. Guys, I get the Great Commission. Everybody's called to, 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 to be a mission, to, 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 to be a disciple maker. Everybody's called to that. Everybody's called. I get that. But God gives more clarity than that because everybody's space in that is different. And if I'm sitting here and my gift isn't the gift of faith and healing, and all I'm doing is praying for people to be healed, watch this. Romans 6, 2, 8. This can change your, this can change your Christianity, guys. This can change it all. Listen to this. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Watch this. Let us use them if prophecy, watch this, in proportion to your faith. He gets very clear here. He says, don't act like, don't pretend. Just do it in proportion of your faith. Watch this. If service, in our serving, what? A a gift is service and serving? 
This is why some people, you can, and they're not carnal, but you can baptize a hundred folks. And they feel like, I feel disconnected. I just don't feel. Because their gifting might be serving. And their prayer isn't about, how can I serve? How, who can I? Let's keep going. I want you to begin to zero in on your purpose. So when you're praying, you're praying and aligned to the gifting, that thing that stirs you up. Watch this. Those who teach in his teaching. Teachers. Teachers. How should I be praying? What's your purpose? What has the Spirit gifted you in? Pray that. The one who exhorts, encourager. You know those people, they're here. They just want to encourage somebody. They just want to, you know, they want to bring you a trinket. You know, they want to bring you a cookie. Yes! It's biblical. It's, it's biblical. He says, do that. He says, do that. It's your gifting. And if you don't do it, not only will you feel, feel unfulfilled, the enemy began to sweep in there and try to tweak. No, no, no. Your gift of encouragement. You don't need to pray about that. You don't need to be praying. Who can I encourage today? Who, who's walking out of the street that all their lives they've been beaten down and told they're worthless and useless and broken? And A, he comes bulging in here. Mind focused on one thing, storms right past them, goes up at Generations Church and starts leading and exhorting and misses them because it's not his gifting. But that encourager sits down next to him and like, you know what? In prayer, I felt to tell you something and I just love you and I, and I brought you this. I know it's getting way too practical for sometimes what we think it should be. I'm in the book. Watch this. Those who contribute, givers in generosity. God, where can I invest in your kingdom? Because it fuels me. If that's not you, that's okay. But if it is you, pray. Pray from your purpose. Those who lead with zeal. Been gift, the gift, been gift with leadership. Put in a position of leadership. Pray. The one who does acts of mercy. <laughs> you, you guys, these are... These are gifts listed in Scripture that should be operation. He's given them all over this place. Unfortunately, it's not too much to say, won't somebody lose the gift of mercy in the house? Because we get stuck on five. And then we skip all Romans. If I'm going to help somebody, the help of the Spirit, with cheerfulness, Because the enemy understands, if he can confuse you, we're, clo we're, we're closed right here. We can, we, we can all stand. This young girl, she hated, she hated to have her mother drop her off at school. My apologies, I forgot we were doing interpretation. I would have slowed my cadence a little bit, used different words. She hated having her mom come with her anywhere because her mom's skin was melted. It was, it was deformed. Her hands, her face. It's like, just don't, just don't. It's, it's embarrassing. And one day she was talking to her, to, her, to her mother, and her mother would put gloves on and put 
scarves around, but at the house, she would just take it all off, and she would, she was like, Mom, why don't you, why don't you want to cover this stuff up? Why don't you want to get rid of the, why, why? And she said, let me, let me tell you a story. She was of age. She sat her down, and she said, when you were a baby, in the middle of the night, I started smelling smoke in the house. We woke up, we jumped out of bed. Fire was everywhere. The house was burning. And you were separate from me in the other room. And there was this wall of fire. And she said, I was able to, to, to squeeze by it to get in there and to, and to get you. She says, but coming out, the fire had grown. And, and there was no way for me to get around it. And she said, I, I wrap you in my arms and I push you up underneath this blanket that I had. And was it hot? Yeah, it was hot. Was it hard? Yeah, it was hard. But I had a purpose. And I ran, and it was dark, so I couldn't go fast. And step by step, I walked through that fire. So you may not understand the scars, but for me, when I see them, I see purpose. I was carrying something so delicate, so important to me, that even though it hurt, it couldn't take me out. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody. Even though I got tired, I had some energy. Even though I suffered pain in the church, even though I suffered pain in my walk with God, I've got my purpose. And because I got my purpose, I know how to pray with purpose. I know how to I may melt, but it won't change my identity. I may hurt, but it's not going to slow me down. In the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And there's not another righteous that's going to pray the prayers that have been gifted to you. There's not, God didn't double stack his system. He's given you certain prayers and certain giftings to align with certain divine purposes that bring an element of the kingdom of heaven to earth that nobody else can do. But you gotta grab it. You've gotta, you gotta hold it. You gotta say, God, no, no, no. The first thing when I get ready to pray is, God, what's my purpose? I get my pain, I get my scars, but what's my purpose? Because if I know my purpose, Whatsoever thing I ask in your name, it will happen. If I know my purpose, I wonder if we can lift our hands up. Oh, I feel the power of God here. There's a spirit of prayer in this place. Two prayers to cry out God, what's my purpose? If you don't know it, that's all you should be praying. Because that's where your power is. The other prayer is, God, let me have your kingdom come. Yeah, 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 that's it. That's it. Some of you that know your purpose, I want to ask you, I want to challenge you, can you push away the pain and focus in on your purpose till everything else calls strangely dim? Can you speak it? Can you pray it? I can't pray it for you. Your pastor can't pray it for you. They have their own gifting. They have their own purpose. We need the prayer warriors to reignite. 
Do you want to pray? Pray from purpose. These altars are open. I know this isn't a conventional but I want to lose the prayers because preaching only goes to a certain part. Ministry only goes to a certain part. God has selected warriors. He has selected and gifted you. If it's acts of mercy, God, who needs mercy? If it's generosity, God, who needs giving? If it's leadership, God, what needs structure? What needs processes? If it's to serve, God, where can I serve? God, what can I do? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Let your voice out. Let your voice out. Now is the time to begin to speak. Faith is in the room. Now is the time to begin to pray. Not like before. Your prayers will be answered. Your prayer will be answered. Whisper his name. Whisper his name. 